success this year. First of all, to the Severe Studios guys, Corey and, and Tim, uh, for, for doing the sound and the
So let's get right into it. Let's talk about what model resolution actually means. Again, you hear about this all the time. Uh, the more technical term for model resolution is known as grid spacing. So a higher res model has more grid points that it actually computes a forecast. So in each one of these, just imagine a ton of grid points inside of a box, and don't worry, I'll show some visuals here in a bit that can help out with that. But each one of these grid points and forecasts is computed. Now, the more forecasts that a model has to compute, the more computing power that's needed, the more time that that can take. Um, but one caveat here is even with these high resolution models and these really fine scale details, there's still things that a model cannot resolve explicitly. So I kind of said that it's CPU intensive. Uh, well, just how CPU intensive? Um, you go out and you buy a laptop in today's society. A nicer laptop, you probably get four cores in a laptop. You get a quad core laptop. Uh, well, here is the, the data center, uh, the ECMWF, and they have uh, about 84,000 cores here in their, in their data center. Um, and, you know, capable of doing 200 plus trillion calculations every second. So, these, you know, and of course we have, you know, similar processing power, uh, you know, we're working to get better here in, in North America, but um, the European, you know, a lot of processing power there. So, so here's, here's an actual uh, diagram of kind of what it means to talk about grid spacing. So over here on the left we have a, a 27 kilometer resolution model here. So each of these grid points is 27 kilometers uh, from the other one. So at each of these points, the model is actually going in and computing a forecast. So everything in the middle is kind of a guess, kind of an interpolation between the data points. And we take a look at a 9 kilometer model, okay, we can see that there's, there's a lot more data points, there's a lot more forecasts being computed. So let's try to put a thunderstorm in that and see how that kind of looks. So we draw an imaginary supercell in there. Uh, we can see, you know, a 27 kilometer model, look at how much of this thunderstorm is not actually being modeled explicitly. So there's, you know, obviously the updraft and, uh, you know, all this stuff, the model has no idea what's actually going on at that point. So it's, it's a guess based on, the, you know, what's going on in each of these data points. Even on a, a nine kilometer model, uh, in this case, there's obviously a lot of portions of the thunderstorm that the model has no idea what's going on. Very important parts, uh, the updraft, of, you know, a mesocyclone tornado, any hail going on here, the model really has no idea, no ability to forecast that directly. Take a look at a, a slightly different case. Um, thank uh, Rich Thompson for providing me this. This is the uh, Mayflower supercell that went over uh, you know, Mayflower on April 27th of last year. This is a, a four kilometer grid that uh, was mainly drawn in. So each of these are four kilometers from each other. And you can see that that's a lot better than when we were looking at that nine kilometer model. So here at four kilometers, we're getting a little bit better. A model can actually go in and compute what is going on in various parts of the thunderstorm. It can model the updraft, it can model the downdraft, and, and things like that. Um, so now you've seen it in kind of a visual form. Let's take another look at it here from a model image standpoint. So we we'll take a look at a model image here again. Uh, nothing really exciting. I had to make this in winter, so we're looking at some 40s across Oklahoma. Uh, but kind of under the map here, we can see you know, we can see some lakes in here, um, and we can see our you know, our temperature contours, colder air on the Panhandle. Well, let's take a look at another model image for the same time. Okay, so now we're looking at a different model. We start to see where we had all those lakes. We kind of have all these little hot spots. Our uh, temperature contours are a little more uh, better defined. You can just tell by looking at the model, there's a little more data there. It's, it's higher resolution. So it doesn't take much to guess that the first model image that we looked at was the 12 kilometer NAM. So again, doesn't look quite as high resolution. And this is the, the HRR. It's a three kilometer model. So again, every three kilometers, forecast is computed. 
And you can see the model's actually able to pick up on those things like the lakes and other, other influences uh, that, can, that can influence the temperatures when you have this high resolution data set. So kind of look at another case here. Again, I had to go off the coast of Florida to find any good visibility to look at. Um, so we have uh, convective available potential energy forecast here. Um, but you kind of bounce to a different model. And okay, you can already see that the data in this model looks a bit better, high resolution. You can see some holes here in the instability. The model may be having actual thunderstorms going on there, kind of using up that instability. So without even really knowing what model we're looking at, you can kind of tell that again, you have a lower resolution model versus, again, the HRR at three kilometers. So which model is the highest resolution? Um, the HRR that runs across the, uh, the continent of the United States, that's the highest resolution model that's updated uh, for the continent of the United States all the time. The NAM4, NAM12, so this kind of goes in a, in a descending order there of, of resolution. We'll talk here later on about uh, what it means to have a parent model like that, but you know, long story short, this is kind of the order of, of models that are out there in terms of resolution. So, we talked about grid points, but what happens in the middle of those grid points? So, this is kind of an illustration here on a one kilometer, a one kilometer grid spacing. There's processes that occur inside of that that even the high resolution models can't, can't pick up on directly. So, between the grid points, it sounds like a soap opera, it's not really. Um, Models such as the, the NAM, RAP, GFS, the Euro, um, they're too coarse, so their grids are too far spaced out to actually resolve individual thunderstorms properly. So to kind of visualize this, the RAP is a, a 13 kilometer model. So that's roughly eight miles. So if you're out there as a chaser, there's a big difference between being eight miles away from the hail core and inside the hail core. If there's a tornado, you're eight miles away, you're not, you might not be able to see it. And, you know, so just to visualize that, there's a big difference when a model doesn't know what's going on for another eight miles. Uh, it's, it's hard for it to explicitly forecast these thunderstorms. Uh, so in these models, again, these, these lower resolution models, uh, we have to use things called convective schemes to kind of simulate uh, these processes. And, in, in short, these convective schemes are really complex sets of, of algorithms, equations that uh, try to model thunderstorm processes since they can't forecast it explicitly. So what a convective scheme has to do is it has to go in and say, is there going to be convection? So when there's various triggers in this convective scheme, you know, if there's, if there's a ton of lift, moisture, you know, thunderstorm ingredients, you know, the convective scheme will go in and trigger. That's when you'll start seeing those things on the NAM com uh, composite reflectivity. You'll see, you know, you'll see what you believe to be thunderstorms. So that's the convective scheme being triggered. That convective scheme has to account for thunderstorm development. What happens when the thunderstorm forms? You have all the, the heating and cooling from the precipitation and uh, upward motion. And then the model has to determine what happens after that, the precipitation byproduct. So, is it going to be cold? You know, is there going to be an outflow boundary? Stuff like that. The model has to try to use this scheme to interpret all of that. So to kind of visualize this here in a sounding, uh, this is a sounding from the NAM 12, again, the 12 kilometer model. I don't remember where it's for, but it's not too important. So we're looking at a 20 hour forecast. Again, it's got some pretty dry air here in the you know, lowest three kilometers. Maybe some high clouds, that's what these white lines are. Uh, this here, this white plot is the value of omega. It's kind of the amount of lift in the atmosphere. So if we go one more hour out, all of a sudden, you see some pretty dramatic changes in this sounding. So we see all this moistening right here in the, the mid-levels, all this cloud cover developed by the model. This omega line goes way out here, so the model thinks there's a ton of lift going on right now. Again, we step back and forth. Uh, you can see this layer of 
cooling here, uh, found in the low levels, is rapid moistening. These things don't really look too realistic. So if we step ahead, we can kind of point out some of these things that are what you'd call convective scheme elements. So things that the model is trying to do to simulate convection. And again, if you start looking at soundings, you'll start to you'll start to see this more and more if you kind of loop through some of those NAM soundings and stuff. So again, we have that rapid moistening that's probably not realistic. Um, again, all these clouds development. So these are things that you need to look for in the model. Um, you know, if you randomly see big changes like that, especially in models like the NAM, the GFS, can indicate that the convective scheme is just uh, just kicked in. Now, obviously convection is not the only thing that models have to have a scheme for. Uh, there's a lot of other processes, and even the high resolution models like the HER, they have to have separate schemes that go in there and forecast and try to model the interactions, um, you know, land surface interactions and radiation and all that. So when people say that models are you know, complex, it's, it's not an excuse for why the model busts in the forecast. It's, there's a lot of com complexities that are, that are in these models that are going to continue to get better with time, but these things take a lot of processing power and a lot of research and development to, to be perfected. So does high resolution mean high accuracy? So in the following few slides, I'm going to kind of show some forecasts for some various high resolution models. And I'll show this, the reflectivity that actually occurred at that same time. Um, take note of, of the forecast thunderstorms, uh, the location, the intensity, and kind of their expected mode. Are they aligned? Are they super cell? So here I have uh, an image. And again, this is, uh, this is from the NAM4. So again, it's a four kilometer model. It's actually able to develop thunderstorms inside the model. So we look here, we see this big supercell looking type deal. And we can see that the model actually has this cyclonic wind field around the model, suggesting that it may be a supercell. But over here on the left side, we have a forecast of updraft helicity, which is the amount of rotation in the updraft. So it's pretty clear here that the model is saying that there is going to be a supercell going you know, across the, into western Illinois. And this forecast may be another model or another supercell out there. Let's take a look at what actually happened. So this is the observed radar at that time. And we can see, okay, this, you know, there's some, definitely some supercell structures out here, probably some large hail. Here's a, you know, here's the area where the first supercell was indicated on the model. So maybe it did okay with this storm, but what about all these? Obviously those are powerful supercells by the looks of them, and there's obviously uh, if you weren't prepared for those, that, that could be something bad. So just take note of that, that, okay, the model did okay, but, you know, is it sufficient to say, well, it got this one, that's good enough. Take a look at a, another day here. This is from uh, April of last year. We see, again, a couple big blobs, reflectivity here. You can kind of see the wind fields in the model saying, okay, maybe this is a big supercell. But take note of the updraft helicity that's forecast here. Again, this is a powerful supercell forecast to go right over Joplin. It's going right over. Again, this is from April. This isn't from the actual tornado that hit Joplin. So if you were to take this forecast at face value and say, oh no, Joplin, you know, you, you got a big supercell coming, for the obvious reasons that could be that could be big trouble. So, and again, we got maybe a supercell collection up here, embedded storms. Take a look at what actually happened. We had a pretty measly squall line. Uh, maybe it did okay up here with, with some you know, <coughs> small supercells and you know, some hail, but, but really, obviously, that, uh, that Joplin storm didn't materialize. I actually chased this day with morning clouds that didn't burn off, no instability really developed. So again, you know, maybe the model did okay up here, but that's a pretty significant difference between what it said over Joplin and, of course, you know, the history of Joplin, if you were to go saying, okay, there's something big coming, that'd be a big problem. Let's take a look at one more here. Again, Western Illinois seems uh, just, back in my hometown here in Macomb, just seems to be getting all these supercells forecasts up there. 
This is from a three kilometer model, so it's even higher than the NAM4 that we showed earlier. This is actually a model that um, myself and my team developed, but you can see it shows even models the hook at here on this forecast supercell across uh, you know, western Illinois, updraft helicity completely maxed out. So the model thinks there's a powerful supercell that's going to be in this area. Let's take a look at what actually happened. Nothing. <laughs> Not a thing. So, you know, I've shown three different cases and the quality has kind of degraded uh, as we went through. But really, the take home with model resolution is high resolution models can, you know, can model thunderstorms uh, explicitly, but, you know, they do, they do take more time to run. Models such as the NAM 12, you know, the GFS, the Euro, RAP, they can't really model thunderstorms individually. So you can't take a composite reflectivity image from, the, you know, the GFS and the NAM and say, supercells out of western Oklahoma tomorrow. I, the, the, the model says it. Um, you know, the supercell process is obviously on a much smaller scale than what that model can actually interpret. But as we just saw a little bit ago, even with high resolution models, you can't take everything at face value. Um, you know, you, the, the idea is to note the potential for strong rotating storms. You know, in that first case, we say, okay, there's a potential for supercells in this area, but you really need to combine some background knowledge of, you know, severe weather conditions to really be able to interpret a model and see if that solution is, is realistic. Okay. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit. We're going to talk about the WERF. That's something you hear chasers all the time. The WERF says this, the WERF says that. What is the WERF? Well, the WERF stands for the Weather Research and Forecasting Model. Um, it does not actually refer uh, to an individual model. So the WERF is basically a, a set of code that you can download. And you, I mean, you could do it on your home computer if you felt so inclined. Take some knowledge and some Linux and Fortran and all that. But you can download it and you can set up your custom parameters. So the HRR, the RAP, NAM, GFS, they're all variants of this WERF code. So they take the WERF, they configure it to how they want, and that's how you get the NAM GFS. That's just what they, what they name it, but they use the WERF code. Again, all these options that we've talked about, such as resolution and where the model's going to run, you can set that in the WERF code itself. Uh, it allows for nesting. Again, we'll talk about that here in a little bit. So, we'll talk quickly about data assimilation. This is really the first step in running any type of model. So, any type of model that runs has to take in some kind of data, whether it's another forecast or it's actually observed <coughs> data. That's the first step in running a model. The quality of observed data is one of the most integral parts of having a successful model run. So when a model runs, uh, it'll take in everything that, that you see here, data from aircrafts, from ships, uh, buoys, surface observations, um, even GPS satellites. We're actually able to uh, calculate out the, the pressure fields in the atmosphere by how GPS signals bounce off and bounce back to the satellites in outer space. We can calculate the pressure fields, uh, radars. So everything you see here is all data that is fed into a model, it's put into you know, a way that the model can understand, but again, having these quality observations is key. If you tell a model that it's 80 degrees out when it's 30, it's going to take quite a while for that model to actually realize that it's not 80 degrees out, and their you know, forecast is, is completely ruined at that point. So again, this is a big graph, we're not going to spend too much time on it, but to kind of show you the process of how the WERF works, how pretty much every model is going to work. Uh, you're going to get some sort of observational data here that's going to be fed into a program that the model can interpret. Uh, just decodes the data, decodes the radar data, and puts it into an observation that the model can understand. Then you have the model that actually runs, does all the computation. That's when you're using all that computing power that we talked about earlier. So this is when the forecast is actually being computed. After that, there's some sort of post-processing that puts it into those, those files that we all, you know, into grid files that are then made into images. Everything you see on the web, um, that has to happen. Uh, the model data has to be put into a format that can be read. 
So again, I talked about analysis here and data assimilation. It's really critical. Uh, so this is actually from quite a while ago. This is, looks like O2, but it's a sounding from here in Denver. So the, the green and red lines are, uh, you know, dew point and temperature. We've all seen that. But the blue lines here and the blue wind marks are what's actually uh, forecast by the model at the same time. So that's the data that the model thinks is going on at the same time of the sounding. So we can see that there's obviously a really substantial difference in the surface temperatures that the model thinks. Um, the model's not picking up on this uh, easterly kind of upslope flow at the surface. Uh, there's some dry air up here, you know, 400. It's not really captured well by the model. So again, there's some there's some errors in the initial data set, and this is always something you should look at as a chaser when you're looking at you know when you want to look at uh, at a forecast. You, know, you might not have to get this advanced, but if you can say, okay, well. Uh, you know, the HR has the cold front up in Nebraska and it's already moved into Kansas and, and things like that. If you can start to see that, you may be able to see why the model's wrong, what may change based on the model. Um, and especially in cases where the weather is driven by these fronts or short waves, if the model has a bad initial data set, it might not know where that short wave is exactly, it might not do well with the front, it could have really big implications on, on the forecast. Okay, so we'll talk about what in the world is a nest. Um, you'll hear this thrown around by chasers, uh, the nested NAM or the nested uh, fire NAM. You'll hear that all the time. Uh, in really simple terms, a nest is a model inside of a model. So we talked about a little bit ago how just how CPU intensive everything is, how uh, intensive it is to run these um, High resolution models. We also talked about just how critical data assimilation is in, in getting a good set of data. So, uh, let's switch over to kind of a graphic here. This is this big box out here that you see. This is the NAM 12. So that's the that's the model that runs out to 84 hours, four times a day, at the 12 kilometer resolution. Now, what a lot of chasers like to look at, they'll look at this four kilometer NAM. So this is actually another model inside of this big one. Now, the value uh, of that is, if you want to run this model, and you're running, you're only running in this area, what if there's a big short wave out here? The model has no idea that is coming. So what you do is you stick this model inside of the larger model, and this, this model out here can say, hey, there's a short wave coming in. That can influence your forecast. And then, that saves you the computation time of having to run this four kilometer model in a very large area. So you still get the data, the model still knows what's coming upstream. And then a lot of times you'll see, uh, again, these are all little nests. The, the NAM has a couple of nests inside of it, Hawaii, Alaska, Puerto Rico. Uh, there's also a little fire weather nest, they call it, that's a, a 1.3 kilometer resolution model, really high resolution. A lot of times it runs over fire weather areas. Sometimes they're nice and give it to uh, give it to us for severe weather areas. But again, the benefit of this is you can run higher resolution models without all the computation, uh, computational power of having to run it at a large scale because you can get the data you need about what's going on out here from those other models. Okay, so again, we're gonna we're gonna switch topics again. I'm trying to cover a whole bunch of broad topics that you'll hear a lot about, you know, as chasers and kind of focus on those. So constructive feedback, most likely you've heard a chaser say, oh, the model's suffering from feedback. Uh, you'll hear NWS mentioned in the forecast. What does that actually mean? Uh, so a model detects conditions that are ripe for, ripe for thunderstorms. So it says, okay, there's a ton of lift here and ton of moisture. We think that the model thinks there's going to be a thunderstorm in this area. So uh, when, when the model detects a thunderstorm development, you're going to have all this latent heat release from condensation. So now you've got all this heat being released in the atmosphere. Well, what has to happen? There's got to be more rising air. So to compensate for that, the model's going to start generating all these strong vertical motions. Um, and you'll see these weird uh, jet maximas, and I've got some images here to show you. Uh, but these are some kind of artifacts that aren't really realistic uh, that you'll see in the model. So we look here at a, at a GFS forecast, 
And again, this is the problem that's not found really so much in high resolution models that actually forecast thunderstorms. This is when a model that can't forecast an individual thunderstorm tries to. It tries to say there's a thunderstorm and then you have, you know, huge thunderstorms trying to develop in a model because the, the grid points are so spaced out. So it develops these huge storms. So in this case, this is a vertical motion plot here. And the poor western Oklahoma looks like a bomb just went off. And uh, you, we have this, you know, the main, the main jet axis and the energy is across the, it's coming out of New Mexico, coming onto, onto the plains, but you have this big, you know, jet maxima right there that, you know, really looks pretty unrealistic. The wind fields are all messed up. So you might not think about it initially, but take a second to realize what this could potentially do to the